Good morning, CCF. Well, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing this morning? How are y'all handling like losing an hour of sleep last night? I needed an extra cup of coffee this morning. I'll gladly admit I didn't want to get out of bed either. But we are so glad that you are here. Welcome to Christ Community Fellowship. If it is your first time joining us for worship this morning, we are so glad that you are here. We are so glad that you have joined us. And if you are tuning in with us on live stream, we are so glad that you have tuned in with us from wherever you are to worship with us this morning as well. My name is Joey Colbert. I'm the student pastor here at CCF, and it is our mission, it is our vision as a church to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by learning from Christ, living in Christ, and leading others to Christ. Uh, my only announcement for the student ministry is, uh, actually I have two, forgive me. Uh, this Wednesday, parents, if your kid is going to church camp, we are going to have a parent meeting this Wednesday following the conclusion of Bible study. We're gonna have, it's gonna be over the camp fundraiser, which is coming up Sunday morning, April 7th. Uh, so actually both my announcements work really well together that way. Uh, so Sunday morning, April 7th, we are going to have a dessert auction fundraiser for our students who are going to church camp. Uh, if you would like to make something for this, uh, please just let me know. It lets me know kind of how many tables to put out for uh, all the various goods y'all will be bringing and making. I am so excited for this. But 100% of the money goes to students who are going to church camp. It goes towards uh, their balance that they're going to be owing. Last year, we took 11 kids, and I think all of them got to go uh, completely covered as a result of the camp fundraiser. So this is a big deal for our kids, and I'm so excited to see it happen. But parents, uh, we're going to have a quick meeting about that this Wednesday night following the conclusion of Bible study upstairs. So for the rest of our church announcements, Ms. Lauren. just have a few this morning. This month is debt reduction month. So if you would like to donate to the building loan, you may do so in the giving boxes at the back, um, online or with your phone by scanning the QR code. Um, also, spring is springing, right? So the mowing crew will have a quick meeting following today's service. If you would like to join that crew, please feel free to stay and join. Uh, and we will have an Easter pancake breakfast on Sunday, March 31st at 9.30. If you would like to help cook, serve, or set up tables the morning of this event, please let the office Thank you, Ms. Lorne. Well, as we said, we are so glad that you have joined us this morning for worship. If you would, would you stand with me? We are going to go into a time of prayer, and then we are going to continue to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we are so thankful for today, for the many blessings that you have given us, Father. Thank you so much for, for being who you are. Thank you for being Lord of our lives, for being for being our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much for, for Jesus, for, for sending him to die on a cross for our sins so that we could have a relationship with you. Father, thank you so much for the provision that you give us in our lives. Uh, Father, I know that you know I catch myself wanting more than I have and not appreciating what I've been given. And Father, thank you so much for what you have provided me in my life. 
Father, as we worship you this morning, uh, Father, prepare our hearts to hear your word as we sing your praises. Father, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, Lord, to, to what you have to say. Be with Bobby as he comes this morning, Father, as he brings the word. Father, speak through him. Help us to learn something new that we can apply to our lives. And as we leave this morning, as we go back to work tomorrow, back to school, Father, wherever we go, help us to be a shining light in our world. Help us to have a kingdom impact in everything that we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. technical difficulties.
not touch the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures in vain Are never enough Then you came along Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Worship His holy name. 
thousand reasons for my heart to find. That's the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Him. John 5, verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him he sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Shame is a prison, cruel as a grave. Shame Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave I'm gonna hold my body down. There ain't no When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no grave. I'm gonna hold my body down. With a smooth and velvet tongue No fear is a tyrant And he's always telling me to run Love is a resurrection And love is a trumpet sound Love is my weapon I'm gonna take my giants down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down
There was a battle, a war between death and life, and there on the tree, the Lamb of God was crucified, and he went on down to hell. It took back every key. Well, we are in week two of a series that we started last week called Red Letter Prayers. And the whole reason that we're doing this was years ago, we had some people who made the decision to make all the words of Jesus in your Bible red, which is really convenient for us because we can look and we can see the things that Jesus said. There's a, that just worked out, but there's a whole full page of just nothing but red letters. And we know that these are things that Jesus said. And one of the things that we kind of wonder a lot of times is how to pray. And in fact, the disciples, one day, these Jewish men who were raised around prayer, they had learned how to pray, they went up to Jesus and they asked him, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Here's how they actually said it. One day, Jesus was praying, his disciples saw him, and when he had finished praying, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Is evidently there was something about Jesus's prayer that was different than anything they had ever heard, than anything they had been taught their entire lives. There was something about Jesus's prayer that captured their attention enough to go to him and go, you're praying and we're coming to this conclusion that you must be the son of God. And it's as if you're talking to yourself, that's, which is interesting, but how do you do that? We don't know how to pray. And many of us, I think, feel this feeling a lot where we just go, I want to pray, and I want to pray more. I want to have this kind of relationship, and I feel like prayer is more than just talking to God. So how do we pray? 
And so last week we saw Jesus did a teaching. And if you, you, you didn't go watch last week or you weren't here last week, we made these cards and we still have some out on both of the tables as you come in. But it's just a guide to help us know how to pray, just a template. Now look, this is just a model. This is just a template. This is not a, this is how you have to do it. Otherwise, prayer is just not going to work. That's not what this is all about at, at all. This is just a tool to help you as you seek to pray more. That's really kind of the whole point of that. But last week we saw that Jesus taught us how to pray. The red letters of scripture taught us how to pray. And you can go back and you can watch that service anytime you would like. But today I want to look at Jesus's prayer. There were prayers that awesomely enough were included in scripture. And I think they are amazing because like today's prayer, I think is so heartfelt, so raw, so authentic because Jesus was going through some stuff and was about to really go through some major stuff. And the reason this prayer I think is so beneficial to us is this life is a lot like being in a current. When I was a kid, one of the things that my parents loved to do was going on float trips, like getting canoes and going on a float trip. I always felt like the canoes were really small, like some kind of Piro, but they were just these small little canoes. And I was a little kid, and I would have to sit in the middle of the canoe, and dad would put mom in the front of the canoe because the person who, doesn't, who knows the least about controlling the canoe evidently is sent to the front of the canoe. And that's where he put mom because otherwise it might have been bad, I don't know. And then he sat in the back, and he would often say, don't paddle, don't do this, leave it alone, you know, because he knows what he's doing. And everything was fine until the rapids started picking up. And Dad would love, he would paddle and he'd paddle and then he would splash the cold, ice cold water onto the lower part of my back and make me jump. I just, I really hated that. I hated sitting in the middle. And I, just, I just really hated this. Well, I don't think, I, I don't really like canoeing now because of that. I'd rather have a kayak because I'm in control, right? I don't know if I have control issues. Maybe I do, but you know, I hate being in that darn canoe. But so if somebody says to me today, like, hey, you want a canoe trip? I'm like, yeah, I'll get a kayak. I mean, I don't want you deciding where I go. But anyhow, so the Lord and I struggle sometimes with that too. But anyhow, let's not get get off on that. So we're in this canoe, and as we're going along, we hit these white water rapids, and I see these big old rocks coming towards us. And at a certain point when you're in a canoe, the inevitable happens. You just have to let physics do its thing. Because at a certain point, the current grabs you, and it takes you where it wants to take you. And when you're sitting in the middle, depending on these two people, one of them telling the other, just don't do anything, because I don't think you know what you're doing. Now, he didn't say it just like that, but you know, it's what it felt like. And here I am in the middle, just hanging on, and just hoping to not be thrown into this horribly frigid, cold water. Just, I'm at their mercy. And life feels a lot like that. It's smooth for a while, everything's fine, and then all of a sudden the current begins to pick up. And it begins to pick up a little bit more. And there's obstacles around, there's all these things you don't want to hit, there's low-hanging tree branches that probably have a snake hanging out in them. There are these big old rocks that you're really hoping that you don't get sucked into those. But the current grabs you. Life does that. There is a current of life that seems to grab us and take us places where we don't want to go. And that's the reality of life. Some days, and all of you have experienced this, you woke up, everything was fine, you thought it's going to be a good day, and a phone call changed that. A doctor's visit changed that. A text message changed change that. You read something and it changed it. And all at once, the current of life grabs you and pulls you in a direction that you did not want to go. And there you are. And everything just changed. Life might not ever be the same, or it might, I don't know. And some of you feel like you're stuck in that current right now. And you can't get out of it. There's no getting out of it. You didn't ask for this. You don't deserve this. You didn't do anything to earn it or not earn it. 
And the current of life will grab a hold of you and pull you in directions that you don't want to go. And here's the reason why I think these red letter prayers are so beneficial. Because Jesus found himself in a place that he did not want to be. And so he prayed. In fact, here's what we learn in Mark chapter 14. That's what we're going to be looking at. Now, I want to tell you before we get to Mark chapter 14, what has happened so far is that Jesus three times from Mark chapter 8 to Mark chapter 14 has predicted to his disciples. He said, guys, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. They are going to arrest me, and they're going to falsely accuse me, and they're going to beat me, and they're going to mock me, and they're going to do all these horrible things, and they're going to say all these horrible things. You're going to hear all kinds of crazy things about me. And they're going to put me on a cross and they're going to kill me. Of course, the disciples are going, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. You're the son of God. If you're really the son of God, surely that wouldn't really happen to you. And Jesus says, yep, it's going to happen. But I want you to love your enemies. That's what I want you to do. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to bless those who persecute you. That's what I want you. I want you to stand firm on that. I'm teaching you this new commandment, this new way of living that's not really a new way of commandment. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. Peter, you're going to deny me. Oh, there's no way I'm going to ever do that, Jesus. Mm -mm, Never deny you. Oh, yeah, Peter, it's going to happen. I'm just telling you it's going to happen. And so they're gathered around for this last supper one night. And as they're in this upper room having this final supper, Jesus identifies without identifying, if that makes sense, who would betray him. Because the Romans had gotten a hold, the religious leaders had gotten a hold of a guy who come forward named Judas and said, I will look for an opera. I will sell Jesus to you. You give me some money, I'll betray him to you. And you'll know who the one is that you are to arrest when I kiss him on the cheek. And I will give him essentially the kiss of death, and you'll know who to arrest. And so the whole time he begins looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. And so they have dinner. Judas jumps up to go do what he has to do. And they go to a garden. Here's what Scripture tells us in Mark 1432, it says, they, they being all of them, the disciples, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. And he took Peter, James, and John, so three, of the addition, three guys of the disciples. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. There it is. We've a feeling that you have felt deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. If you've ever wondered, does Jesus know how you feel? It's right here. And this is a deeper feel. See, this is not just a job feeling for Jesus. You know, I wish I had a job, but I don't have a job. This isn't just a small health issue for Jesus. This is a big deal. This isn't just a relational thing. A cra- you know, you got a crazy son or a crazy daughter, a crazy family member, a crazy boss, or all of the above. Crazy teachers, crazy coaches, crazy whatever. Th- this is deeper than that. Now, the thing about Jesus is this. Jesus knows what's coming. See, you and I, we don't know what's coming. Could you imagine knowing everything that Jesus knew in this moment, what that would do to you? Like, it makes me in many ways glad I don't know the future because Jesus knew what was coming. I mean, he is, was 100% God before he stepped on the planet Earth. When he stepped on the planet Earth, he still 100% God, but also took on human flesh and became 100% human. And so as Jesus steps on earth, he knows everything that's coming, yet he becomes deeply distressed. Deeply, deeply, deeply distressed. And here, verse 35, it says, he went a little further, fell 
on the ground. And he prayed. He prayed. In his distress, he prayed. Just like me and you. In our distress, we pray. And he prayed this. Here's what he said. If it's possible, the awful hour waiting him might pass him by. I do not believe, this is my opinion, but I think the text is going to back it up here in just a second. I'll show you. I do not believe for a second that Jesus is concerned about what a human being is going to do to him. Was it the beatings that Jesus is concerned of in this moment? No, I don't think so. Was it the nails going through his hands and feet as he's pierced and placed and raised up on a cross? I don't think so. What is it that Jesus is so concerned of? Here's what I believe. Because God made him who had never, ever sinned become sin, that you and I can have the right relationship with God. Never has the Son felt a separation from the Heavenly Father. And he knows, because he knows the future, he knows from right that moment right there that he's going to set, or excuse me, hang on a cross and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he knows that's coming. And here's what the text tells us. It goes on and says this. It says, well, I don't want to, re- I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, I do too. Let's go. Here's what he says. As he prays, he says, Abba, Father. I'm going to break this down. We're going to leave this, I'm going to leave this text up here. I'm going to break this down for you. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup. Cup literally means the wrath of God poured out. That's what that means. And that's why Jesus is praying what he's praying. Of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Now, let's just break this down. Let's just take and just, we're, gonna, we're just really going to dissect this thing and really pull it apart. Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Interesting choice of words. See, last week we saw where they asked Jesus, how do we pray? And he says, pray like this, our Father. But Jesus does something different here. He says, Abba, Father, which is Aramaic for my Father. Not just our Father. This is way different than starting off a prayer like this. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. This is way different than the man upstairs and the big guy in the clouds. Or, this is way different. This is, this is not just father. This is my, my father. My father in heaven. This is my father. This is personal. And you might would say, well, that's awesome that Jesus can say that, but That's Jesus. Of course, he can say, my father. I can't say my father. Well, actually, yes, you can. John chapter 1, verse 12, very famous passage that many of you know. But all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Watch this. This is about to fire me up. I'm just going to warn you before we get there. Galatians chapter 4. Just wait for it. Galatians chapter 4. You're not going to see it on the screen, but it's up there. It says, we are adopted as his. As a matter of fact, here's what it says. That God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts, prompting us to call him Abba Father. Whoa. You are allowed. Bring that slide back up. You are allowed to call him Abba Father. You, when you are in distress, can say, my father. You want to know why? Let me tell you why this is a big deal. Years ago when I was in college, I had my truck break down on Interstate I-30. And I'm just outside of Benton, and all there is is this little truck stop. And so I limp my truck up to this truck stop. And I get to this truck stop, and it's in the middle of nowhere off Military Road. And I begin to think, this looks like a perfect place for like a Criminal Minds episode. They're going to kill me. You know, I'm going to come up missing. I can't go anywhere. And since I was in college, I didn't legally have a gun. We'll go with that. So I called home. 
And mom answered the phone. It's late at night. It's about 11 o'clock at night. And I said, Mom, where's dad? Well, he's in bed. You know he's been in bed for, I need dad. I said, well, what's going on? I need my father because I feel like I'm in trouble. And I'm sorry, mom. I'm a mama's boy, way closer to my mom than my dad. My dad's not perfect, made a lot of mistakes. But I'm going to tell you something. If you mess with me, he'll kill you. I mean, that's, that's not an that's not, that's not overstatement. You mess with me, my daddy would take your life or he would die trying. I need my father because I'm in trouble. This is the start of Jesus' prayer. Listen, listen, look at me. This is the start of your prayer. I'm in trouble, and I need my daddy. I don't need anybody else. I don't need money. You've got a problem that money can fix. It's what? Not a problem. I need my daddy because my dad can do anything. Everything is possible for you. I need my daddy. You want to know why I need my daddy? Because everything's possible. There's nothing he can't fix. There's not a mountain that he can't move. There's not a sickness that he can't cure. There's not an issue that he can't pay for. There's not, enough, there's not a big enough financial problem for him. There's not a big enough health scare for him. There's not a big enough crisis for him. I need my father because my father can do anything at all. There's nothing my dad can't do. And he goes on, he says, please take this cup of suffering away from me. I want to get rid of this. And we've all been here. And we've all asked, and we ask this a different way. We may say something like this. Please take this idiot away from me. Please take this boss away from me. Please take this health thing away from me. Please fix this. Fix this financial issue. Fix this problem. Fix that. I need you to do something about this. I need you to fix this. Your heavenly father, who is your daddy, wants you to bring it before him. But the problem for a lot of us is this is where we stop in this prayer. This is where we stop. And this is why we get angry when God says, that's not how I'm going to interact. That's not how I'm going to deal with this. See, this is a place where we get mad. Because God, I told you, you're my father, and you can do everything. I want you to fix this. And if God says, that's not how I'm going to do this, that's not how this is going to work out, we get angry. And if your prayer stops here, you will stay angry at God for not fixing that thing that you told him to fix because he didn't fix it like you wanted it fixed and when you wanted it fixed. It's not a guarantee that God's going to say, yes, well, sure, you said, Abba, Father, absolutely, I'm here. Everything's possible. You're absolutely right. Everything is possible. I want you to take this cup of suffering away from me. Well, I I got a bigger plan, though. See, your heavenly Father, and the reason Jesus prays this prayer is because the foundation of his prayer, the bedrock of his prayer is this, you are my Father, which means you love me more than anything else and anyone else in this world could ever love me. And you care about me more than anyone else will ever care about me. And you can do anything, and you can do everything, and I acknowledge that you are all powerful. And Jesus is able to say this next line because he knows that his father wants more for him than he wants from him. I want your will to be done, not mine. You know mine. You know what I want. You know I want out of this. You know I want you to fix this. I want your will more than my way. This is full surrender. Now, I want you to know something about this. Jesus didn't say this one time, and all of a sudden, he felt good about it. Scripture actually tells us that he prayed this for an hour. I'll show it to you here in a minute, but he prayed it for an hour, saying this over and over again. For an hour, 
went back to his disciples. Of course, they're sleeping. I mean, they're conked out, knocked out, like they're on some kind of, some kind of sleeping medicine. They took some Benadryl or something right before, and he says, guys, come on, wake up. Wake up, wake up with me and pray. He goes back. And he prays this again. He comes back. They're still, they're still zonked. And he goes back and he prays this again. He did this three times. He went and he wrestled and he wrestled with it because he, was, he did not want to deal with this. But he wanted God's will more. And you're like, how does that work with the Trinity? I don't know. It's complex and difficult. But however it worked out, he wrestled with this, literally wrestled with it. And, and friends, listen to me. That's the Son of God. You and I are going to wrestle with this at times. We're going to wrestle with this last statement. You're not going to say this one time, and all of a sudden, boom, you just power up and feel good about yourself, and you're ready to whip the world and charge hell with the empty water pistol and all that. It's not going to work that way. There is a wrestling taking place here, which means for you and means for me that there are times where we're going to have to wrestle this thing to the ground for our lives because this doesn't just happen like that. I would love to say you can pray this prayer and say this sentence, God, a Father, everything's possible for you. Take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then you walk away and you're like, you puff your chest out and you're confident and feel good about it. I'd love to say you can say it one time and now it's all of a sudden fixed. But that's just not real world. And that's not what the Savior did. He wrestled with it. But the interesting thing is this. There is a shift that we see. It's kind of subtle in the text. We're going to look at it. But when Jesus finally gets to this place of full surrender, there is a shift in what Jesus says. Let me go back and read verse 41. Not really back, but when he returned to them the third time, there's your proof, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. And this is where the, the language changes. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. See, he started this prayer overwhelmed, started this prayer distressed, deeply distressed. And then we get to the end of this prayer, this place of full surrender. And there, there is this, this confidence factor of, okay, Lord, I want your will more than my way, and I surrender to that. You are my Father, and you want for me more than you want from me. So I trust you. And in this moment is this great moment of power, great moment of confidence in his Father. So here's the summary. What does this kind of look like? This prayer is kind of summarized like this. You are my father, and you can do anything, and I surrender to you. The foundation of prayer is you are my father. You are my dad, and I surrender to you because I know that you see the big picture. I know that you know everything. I know that you know everything before it's even going to happen. But the interesting thing is, and you're going to see what happened, as Jesus prayed through this, the disciples slept through this, and we're going to see the difference. The scripture in verse 37, we're going backwards a little bit. It says, when he returned and found them asleep, they're sleeping, he said to Peter, Simon, Peter, are you, or Simon, he didn't say Simon, Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one Hour? Keep watch and pray so that you don't give in to temptation. Interesting phrase here, but he knew they would be tempted. For the spirit, the spirit that is the human spirit, not the Holy Spirit, is willing, but the physical body obviously is weak and ready to sleep, by the way. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. And they didn't know what to say. 
But I want you to see what happens next. As Judas shows up, verse 45, it says, as soon as they arrived, they being the guys to arrest him, Judas walked up to Jesus, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him a kiss. And the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him, but one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Now, we know based on the other gospel writers that that person who pulled out a sword was Peter. And we also know this, Peter was not aiming for his ear. Okay? Like, the guy moved. I guess he must have done like one of these maneuvers. He turned his head sideways. I really don't know. I'm guessing. Let's just say this. Sword was coming. Guy got out of the way. Peter was going for his head. Now, wait, wait, wait. Peter, aren't you the guy who's going to be like the guy who starts the church? Yeah. Wait a minute, Peter. Were you there when Jesus said something about love your enemies? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. You remember that part where, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself? Is this being very neighborly? No. Because Peter slept through. Jesus prophesied everything that was getting ready to happen. And not only that, this this warrior who powered up and buffed up and swung a sword is going to deny even knowing Jesus. That is, after Jesus had told him, that he would deny him. Here's what happened to the rest of the disciples. Verse 50, when Jesus is arrested, all of his disciples deserted him and ran away. Interesting thing, when Peter denied Christ, let me just show you this last little text, and we'll wrap it up. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. Here's what Peter said. Peter said, no. Peter declared emphatically, not just a no. I mean, it was a big no. Even if I have to die with you, I will never, I hate that word, never, never. I never, I don't don't even like to say that word. And I hear kids, they'll sit there and go, I would never do that. Don't say never, man. That's like asking yourself for problems. I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same, that they scampered off like little rabbits like roaches when you turn the lights on, whenever Jesus was arrested. Even though they vowed the same, they slept through. They slept through the whole thing. And the lesson that we find here is this. When you pray, you find the strength to go through literally anything. Any fear, any frustration, any anger, any difficulty, any adversity, whatever words you want to throw in there, when you pray, and when you get to this place where you surrender to your heavenly Father, you find the strength, the confidence. Why? Because your dad, who can do anything, is there. When you find, when you pray, you take on the strength of the rescuer. I never became a lifeguard. I just wasn't interested in it, but my brother became a lifeguard. And one of the things I know from lifeguard training, see, we were actually taught in school in emergency care. We're taught, let them drown, get them out, then save their lives, which is kind of an interesting philosophy. That's what we're literally taught because we have the skills and the the tools to do that. But lifeguards are taught, you jump in the water and go get them. And when you get to the person, if you can get them to calm down, if you can get them to stop kicking and screaming, if you can begin to get them to trust you instead of their panic and their worry and their freaking out moment, then you can save them and get them out of the water. The interesting thing is this, the person being rescued when they surrender and stop fighting, take on the strength of the rescuer. It's a newfound kind of strength. See, surrender is not an act of weakness. It's gaining the power of the rescuer. When you surrender to your heavenly father, you are grabbing the strength of a heavenly father who can do anything and everything. That's what you get. I am so glad that this raw prayer is in Scripture. Because Jesus not only 
teaches us how to pray. He shows us. He shows us what this looks like. Shows, it, shows us what it looks like for us. Because, see, the, the current of life is going to grab you at certain points. And you will be in places where you don't want to be, in situations that you don't want to be in, in circumstances you didn't ask for. And what you're able to do is this. And here's what we can remember from this. The first thing is this. Father, all things are possible for you. And not just any father, but my father. All things are possible for you. You know what I want. You know what I want. You know I want you to change this. You know I want you to stop this. You know what I want. I'm bringing it before you. Father, all things are possible for you, and and I know you can change this. I know that you can snap your fingers and stop it right now. But if there's no other way, I want your will over my way. Because you're Father. You're my dad. And I know that you're fighting for me. You know what I want. If you're not going to change it, then I'm going to ask you this. Make it count. Use it. Change it or change me. If you're not going to change this, then I'm asking you to make it count for your glory and for my good. And that is how we learn what prayer looks like. This is a prayer of confidence. My dad defeated death. He went to the cross, and he was nailed to the cross, and he died on that cross because of obedience to the Father. I mean, Philippians would later tell us, as Paul wrote it, he would say he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I often think, how hard would it be for me to be obedient to the point of death if I have the power to stop it? Because Jesus could have stopped it at any moment. But he didn't. Because he wanted a relationship with you. He wanted it to be possible for you to be adopted in, Gentiles like us, to be adopted in, so that the spirit of the Son could be upon us, so that way we were able to call him my Father, from the garden of Gethsemane of your life, I am able to call him my Father. Heavenly Father, thank you for that. Thank you that you made this possible. You can do all things, and there are things that we wish you would change. But help us to get to this place. And we may have to wrestle our way all the way there. But help us get to this place where we say, I want your will more than my way. And there are times where you you change things. You, You reach your hand into the depths of the needs of our souls and you change it. And we thank you for those. We thank you for those moments. But there are also times where we have a thorn in our flesh and we pray three times and each time you say no. But you always give us enough grace to get through, to sustain us. Help us to trust in that. Help us to live in the middle of that. When occurrence of life surround us and grab us, may we trust in you because you are our dad. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have-